When Mao Zedong died in 1976, China was a poor, largely rural nation. Per capita income was under $200. The urbanization rate was under 20%. And when Deng Xiaoping took control two years later, it was clear that the country needed a new economic direction. During the 1950s, Mao followed Stalin's lead and attempted to speedily industrialize China from above. The Great Leap Forward tried to turn farms into steel factories and largely failed. The resulting famine also echoed the consequences of Stalin's forced industrialization. In 1958, China also instituted its household registration, or hukou system, which was meant to control population movements and specifically to limit the growth of cities. The Communist Party recognized the threat of urban disorder. During the early 1960s, China's leaders also started relocating city dwellers to farms. This process exploded during the Cultural Revolution. Between 1966 and 1976, the Down to the Countryside movement sent 16 million urbanites to experience the poverty of rural China. While this policy created significant hardship, the urbanites actually brought some knowledge into rural China, which, according to the research of Yang Yu, created economic benefits decades later. Deng Xiaoping himself had been purged during the Cultural Revolution, and he was sent to work in a tractor factory in rural Shanxi. His moderation made him anathema during those years of ideological purity. But Deng was resurrected with the support of Premier Zhu Enlai in 1974, and he proved to be the canniest political infighter in the months after Mao's death. In December 1978, the Communist Party's Central Committee affirmed both his leadership and their commitment to pragmatic economic reform. Deng famously declared that it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice, and that spirit was infused into the new China. In rural China, Deng's reforms meant the cooperatives were dismantled, and farmers became freer to make their own decisions and to benefit from their own productivity. In foreign affairs, Deng initiated greater openness and trade with the outside world, and in 1980, Deng started the policy of special economic zones, which would transform small fishing villages into mighty urban powerhouses. The idea behind special economic zones is straightforward. These are places where foreign investors could operate and employ Chinese labor. Taxes would be low and regulations limited. But since they were spatially constrained, the rest of China would be free from contact with the outside world. The hukou system remained in place, but it was no longer enforced in the same way. Rural dwellers could move to cities, but they just would not receive the same public services as longer-term urbanites. Shenzhen is perhaps the most iconic of these special economic zones. Established in 1980, Shenzhen grew in the shadow of Hong Kong. Its close proximity to that haven for Chinese emigres meant that Hong Kong investors could easily do business in Shenzhen and bring both capital and know-how. In dense urban confines, knowledge spread from outsiders to the citizens of China, and an industrial megacity emerged. Initially, Shenzhen mainly produced low-tech goods like garments, which was natural enough since Hong Kong was also a garment-making center. Like Singapore, Shenzhen gradually moved up the food chain and became a high-tech center in the mid-1990s. By 2015, it had become a sleek and wealthy technopolis, with a total GDP of about $270 billion. In 1984, Deng started opening more Chinese cities to international investment. Shanghai reclaimed its central role as the financial capital of China and the conduit between the Middle Kingdom and the outside world. China had great cities when Europe lived in medieval darkness, and China's cities were again becoming wonders of the world. Today, China's per capita GDP is about $8,000, and the country is about 56% urbanized. Chinese urbanization was not without risk to the government. In 1986, urban university students began demonstrating for greater freedom. The party's general secretary, Hu Yaobang, took a tolerant attitude toward the students. And when he died in 1989, thousands took to the streets to affirm his legacy and demand reform. Tiananmen Square became the focal point for the massive demonstration. Thousands and thousands came, and eventually Chinese leaders had enough. The People's Army retook control of the city. That armed force ended any urban movement for political reform for at least a generation. Westerners have long deplored the conditions in some Chinese factories. American labor unions and politicians argue that it is wrong that American workers should have to compete with underpaid Chinese. While it is surely true that life in a Chinese factory has typically been far worse than life in the US, that isn't really the right comparison. Chinese workers are willing, even happy, to take such low wages because their other options are so much worse. While urban China has experienced income growth that is almost miraculous over the last 30 years, rural China is typically still quite poor. 
China's industrial growth has generated enormous economic disparities, both between individuals and across space. Guizhou, for example, is still largely rural, and per capita income levels are less than half of those in Shanghai. Across the country, per capita income is about three times higher in urban China than in rural China. China's 2015 statistical yearbook notes that 2014 disposable incomes in rural China were about 10,000 yuan, or about $1,400. Prices, of course, are lower in rural China, but 1400 bucks isn't a lot of money by any measure. Somalia has a per capita GDP of about $1,400. While U.S. urbanization rose thanks to enormous agricultural productivity, China, like many developing world countries today, has experienced urbanization along with enduring agricultural poverty. The result is that China has almost become two nations, one middle-income and urban, the other still poor and rural. In light of these enormous income disparities, the question is not why Chinese urban workers are willing to accept wages that seem low by Western standards, but why there is anyone still living in rural China. There are many answers to that question, including the low cost of rural living, the hukou system, the social networks that provide some security in traditional agricultural communities, and the danger that cities especially pose to women and children. There isn't an obvious fix for China's rural poverty. China has figured out how to use cities to integrate Chinese labor into the global economy, but like much of the developing world, China has not solved the puzzle of making its rural areas rich. While we may hope for a new agricultural revolution that will spread wealth throughout the world's poorest farms. We must also recognize that for now, as China's example illustrates, urbanization is the best hope for a more prosperous planet.